Head coach Jim Carlin enjoyed four successful seasons at West Virginia, including a sparkling 10-2 record in 1969. The year was capped off with a record-setting win over South Carolina in the Peach Bowl. But as far as West Virginia fans were concerned, the biggest game that year took place in Morgantown, where the Mountaineers crushed Pitt for the third year in a row. The powerful backfield of Eddie Williams, Bob Gresham, and Jim Braxton took control of the game, and the Mountaineers cruised to victory 49 to 18. Pitt Panthers left West Virginia that day battered and bruised, for the 31-point loss was their worst ever at the hands of the Mountaineers. Nineteen seventy would hold some measure of revenge for Pitt as new Mountaineer coach Bobby Bowden suffered through the worst defeat in his career. The most embarrassing game I have ever been situated in my life was my first game against Pitt in nineteen seventy, and it's, I, I, I embarrassed the whole state of West Virginia. I embarrassed myself. I embarrassed my team. We played them up there in nineteen seventy. We led them 35 to 8 at the half. I mean, it was a rout. And we go out there the second half and get beat. Uh, that's the worst thing that has ever happened to me in football. If the 36-35 loss remains as one of Bowden's darkest moments, then his brightest day arrived in 1975, when his squad finished 9-3, and three, won a Peach Bowl championship, and pulled out one of the biggest wins in the history of Mountaineer football. Jack Fleming, along with Woody O'Hara, West Virginia University football, 1975. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A jam-packed house for the West Virginia pit game on the campus of West Virginia University. I remember before that game, before the pit game, before we went out, the governor came in, and uh, it was so quiet in there, it was scary. I think the coaches were nervous. Nobody was saying anything. It was You could drop a pin and you could hear it. We were ranked, I believe at that time, ninth, and Pitt was ranked, was ranked eighth. And we didn't really like each other much, and it was a slugfest the first half. It ended up at halftime 0-0. Zero, zero. Destined to be a fight to the finish, West Virginia was able to pull ahead twice in the second half. But each time, Tony Dorsett and the Panthers battled back to tie. After more than 59 minutes of rugged hand-to-hand -hand combat, the score in this backyard brawl remained tied 14-14. With less than a minute to go, Pitt was on about their 10-yard line and had to punt to us. So we fielded it about the 50. The last play we ran before we kicked, uh, Danny Kendra was the quarterback. He dropped back and hit Swenson uh, on a swing pattern, and he caught it and got knocked out of bounds, and that stopped the clock. He got knocked out of bounds. I don't know if we could have stopped the clock. With just four seconds remaining, it all came down to sophomore kicker Bill McKenzie. Four seconds to go. Holy mackerel. Can you believe this? Bill McKenzie is on. It will be a 38-yard attempt. The snap. McKenzie kicks it. It is long enough. McKenzie kicks it. It is good. The ball game is over. McKenzie kicks a 38-yard field goal in the final play of the football game. There's a bomb speed out of the field. Now, it was the most exciting ending I've ever seen. When he kicked that goal, the kids turned around and mobbed him. Then our team went out there and mobbed him. He was on the ground and everybody just laying on top. Then the fans came out of stands and, and it was just one big pile up. That's one of the most exciting wins I've ever been involved with in my life. The Mountaineers, the Mountaineer fans, what a mob scene. You haven't seen anything like it. Old Mountaineer Field was uh, part of that university. There was something special about it. And we were very difficult to beat there. And, I mean, you know, when he shot off that gun and you came out, out on that field, I mean, you were ready to play. And like I always said, you, you might beat us, but you're not going to get out of town. <laughs> Old Mountaineer Field stood for 55 years in downtown Morgantown as the official home of West Virginia football. Rising above the Monongahela River, a tradition was built upon this gridiron, a tradition of mountaineer pride and pageantry. The people were right down on top of you. 
uh, everybody was right down on the and the, the sounds and when they when that band came out of that closed into that stadium uh, through that uh, horseshoe and people just packed you know, to get in there I mean they live and die for tickets to come up there and, and that there was no place to park and there was so it, it was there was a tremendous amount of camaraderie that came about because of people parking their cars and and walking and eating downtown and they were all together and then they all sort of funneled into that stadium and then funneled out to go home you know at the end of the day Mountaineer Field was so cramped that when we play Pitt or somewhere like that there would be like 37,000 people in a 34,000 seat stadium and on the sideline it was so packed that the visiting team would have to ask people to move out the way so they can get on, on and off to the field and so forth and the people right on top of you the old stadium, number one, everybody sat on the field. I, really, I mean, literally, there wasn't a bad seat in the house. And so as, as a coach, you're standing right there, those people, you could hear everything they called you. Now in the end zone, when you catch a pass, there's a guy standing right there ready to catch you, you know. And so everybody was sitting right on top of you, and uh, it was just a great place to play, because everybody there was for you. During the 60s and 70s, Mountaineer fans were treated to a non-stop parade of all-star talent. Names like Dick Lethbridge, Eddie Williams, Bob Gresham, and Mike Sherwood in the 60s were followed by Pete Wood, Artie Owens, Dan Kendra, and Kerry Marbury in the 70s. Three names, however, rise above all others as superstars of these West Virginia glory days. Halfback Garrett Ford, number 32, arrived in Morgantown from Washington, D.C., and proceeded to rewrite the Mountaineer record books. Ford had the strength and size to power through the line, and then, once on the other side, his long, graceful stride left defensemen struggling to catch up. I was never very fast, and uh, I was a good player on a fair team. I, it amazes me because uh, now you hear people saying, boy, you were you know, a great player, this and that. I was never a great player. <laughs> I really wasn't. I never had great speed, but I, I liked playing football, and I ran hard and did the best I could with it. My big thing was I just liked to run over top of me, and I didn't, have any, I didn't worry about going outside or going around. It was one-on-one, -on -one, and especially if you, were, if you were defensive back, it was all over for you. Following Ford was All-America fullback Jim Braxton, number 44. If Ford could be compared to a sleek and slippery cat, then Braxton was a charging locomotive. And once he built up a head of steam, he was nearly impossible to stop. In both 1969 and 70, he led West Virginia in scoring, though not just by virtue of his 22 touchdowns. The Burley fullback was also the team's place kicker, and after every touchdown, he would hurry to change shoes in order to kick the extra point. He became known as the prototype of the NFL's modern-day power fullback, and will remain forever as one of the greatest runners in Mountaineer history. During the mid-70s, Bobby Bowden's wide-open offense was fueled by an All-American flanker named Danny Bugs. Bugs' sure hands and lightning speed provided the game-breaking threat the Mountaineers needed through the air as well as coming off his trademark flanker reverse. Bugs' most memorable moment came in 1972 when with West Virginia trailing Maryland with just six seconds left in the game, Danny Bugs took the ball at his own 31 and almost single-handedly carried the Mountaineers to victory.